go in order. Uh, Michelle Burns is a graduate of Project Leadership, which prepares parents to become advocates for healthcare policy and service improvements. She has extensive experience conducting training, policy, advocacy, and program development for nonprofit organizations dedicated to improving housing and services for low-income families and former foster youth, including the John Burton Foundation, Bridge Housing, and United Way of the Bay Area. She has a master's degree in public policy from UC Berkeley and a BA from the University of Michigan. Michelle is also a member of the Family Advisory Council at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital, Oakland. And Michelle will be speaking first today. Uh, next in order of appearance is Emily Lacayo, the proud mama to a blossoming young lady with multifaceted medical needs and is very familiar with the complex stressors and pleasures of being both a medical professional and a mother to a medically fragile child. She's highly interested in bringing cultural awareness trainings as a supplemental tool for the medical field, further closing the divide between professionals and Latino parents. In her free time, she serves as a parent member for the Family Advisory Council, CCS Families, and as a member of the National Association of Hispanic Nurses. She enjoys impromptu soccer scrimmages, lively salsa dancing, and above all, just being a mom. She earned a BA in Sociology minor in Spanish from San Jose State and a Master's of Science in Nursing, Clinical Nurse Leader from the University of San Francisco. Next on the panel is uh, Daniel Vasquez, the parent of a resilient little girl with complex healthcare needs and understands firsthand the joys and trials of balancing the roles of professional and father to a medically complex child. He has a special interest in educating the Latino community about services and rights, particularly in empowering fathers to find their own voice in the lives of their children with special health care needs. In his free time, he serves on the school site council at Cyril's, sorry, I'm probably saying that wrong, yeah, that's good. That's good. <laughs> elected in 2014 and as a parent member for Children's Regional Integrated Service System Council and enjoys hiking, culinary exploration, writing and illustrating his first children's book, and most importantly, being a dad. He earned a BA in Sociology and Behavioral Science from San Jose State. Uh, finally, uh, Charisse LeBlanc is raising two beautiful teenagers, Kayla and, I didn't ask you this, but Joaquin? Yes, Joaquin. With their dad, Matthew. In her former life, she was a wilderness backpacker, world traveler, and a college student at USF, UC Berkeley, and Mills. Currently, she is an educator with a credential in life science and has taught full-time and in various programs in the Bay Area for over 20 years. In addition to focusing on environmental education and sustainability, much of her work has been with students in special education and alternative education, working to bring inclusion into our schools and communities. She has found organizations like Support for Families of Children with Disabilities, Bay Area Outreach Recreation Program, and Family Voices, just to name a few, to be invaluable. Charisse is grateful to be a graduate of Family Voices Project Leadership, and has, that has provided many opportunities to become a skilled advocate for Kayla, her daughter with special health care needs. Shared humanity, creativity, love of nature, mindfulness, and social justice are central to the universe. So please join me in welcoming our panel. They'll each seek uh, for a few to share their story, and then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. everyone can you hear me okay Great. Um, as she said I'm Michelle Burns it's a real pleasure to be here today and I really feel honored to be on the same um, panel with Daniel and Emily and Sharice um, we all graduated from project leadership at the same time about a year ago um, I also want to say that I feel like most of my remarks could be basically saying ditto to everything that Erica <laughs> said I thought that was amazing everything that you touched on and um, I feel like you probably, I, I felt like you had lived my life already. It's pretty amazing. Um, so a little bit about my family's history. Um, five years ago this summer, uh, when my son was two weeks old, he was diagnosed with failure to thrive, which is a very terrifying diagnosis for any parent and to me felt like I was being given a diagnosis myself of failure to be a good mother. and. Um, I had spent his every hour um, up until that point trying to feed him 
and moving further and further away from kind of my ideal of being able to nurse him and then bottle feeding him and then using a dropper and a syringe and everything you can imagine until finally um, we ended up in the NICU. And um, at that point he'd lost about uh, almost 15% of his body weight just in two weeks. And we spent about you know seven or eight hours in the emergency room, middle of the night in the NICU. And I look back at myself at that point and I realized, I remember the terror that I felt, but I also realized how much I didn't know and how um, inexperienced I was and oblivious to kind of what was um, in our future and um, for what was in the future for my son and how much of a journey we still had to go. Um, but I did know that I wanted for him to be okay and that I was willing to do anything I could to make that happen. So we spent the summer in the NICU, and I say we intentionally because any sort of hospital experience is obviously going to affect the whole family regardless of how many hours you actually are able to spend there. Um, and at that time we really didn't know if my son was going to come home ever, if he would ever see his big sister again. Um, I, um, when we did bring him home, um, I felt some relief that we were out of the hospital, but not as much as they kind of kept building up for us because there was so much to manage and I really had no idea what we were doing um, in terms of managing his care, um, caring for um, our daughter who is typically developing, keep our jobs, um, ever leave the house, all of that felt really overwhelming. Um, and any sort of, um, any family with a child with special health care needs, including those of us on this panel, um, certainly face very different things depending on what kind of health issue um, is going on with their child. But what we do share is a realization that our children were not born kind of the way that we had expected um, and the pain of that and um, also the subsequent pain of trying to access resources without any sort of roadmap. Um, and obviously any parent is has a child and um, without any sort of roadmap, but when your child has extra medical needs, it feels especially daunting. Um, over the course of the last five years, my son has really received excellent medical care, um, but when I consider the transition from being inpatient at various points to making the transition to being in charge of his care at home, um, especially in the first few years, which were the most intense, I feel like um, we were basically the nurse, the case manager, the care coordinator, the pain specialist, the feeding therapist, the occupational therapist, and in my son's case, a feeding tube specialist, um, 24 hours a day. And it felt like we were kind of getting on the job training with incredibly high stakes, without any training in advance and without any sort of supervision. So it was pretty terrifying. Um, and I remember at one point when uh, my son's feeding therapist said to me, we developed a really close relationship and she became one of my rocks and all this. And she said, you know, Michelle, you're not his feeding therapist, you're his mother. And I just wept and I said, but that's not true because <laughs> the reality was, is I wasn't just his mom, I'm not just his mom, I was his feeding therapist and so many other things. And if I didn't play those roles, I didn't know if he was be going to be okay. Um, so what I wanted to talk briefly about is um, kind of what would have made this, this journey easier. Um, we went home with one kind of feeding tube when my son was a newborn and then seven months later with a different kind of feeding tube. And we got training from the nurses in the hospital, but we really didn't know in practice what, how to manage that at home. Um, and again, to echo Erica, you know, we're coming into this, I, I come from a two-parent household. My husband and I are well-educated. English is our first language. We have a large extended family. I have kind of every resource in terms of like being able to navigate this. Um, and it still felt like we went home um, really in crisis. And I really didn't know um, how to manage or even what questions to ask. And um, we've seen um, our specialists have been, my son's specialists have been at, um, at UCSF, Benioff, Oakland, San Francisco, and at Packard in Palo Alto. 
Um, and some of those we've had relationships with, oh, sorry, for almost um, <laughs> his entire life. But I can't remember actually ever being asked if we needed any additional support. I think that we didn't, we showed up to clinic every appointment. We, you know, maintained everything that we needed to at home. And so I don't think that it looked like we were falling apart at the seams. And I think just something to remember is that families can get to the clinic, well, many times they can't, but when they can get to the clinic, that in itself is a huge accomplishment, but that doesn't mean that they don't need additional support at home. And what I also saw is that there weren't any sort of parents involved in our preparation or training. So um, there's a lot of talk about discharge planning, starting an admission, a lot of um, kind of patient and family-centered care. But what I really think needs to happen is any sort of inpatient training, if you're going home with any sort of durable medical equipment, if you're getting a new diagnosis, if you don't have a diagnosis at all, that there needs to be a parent there to help you navigate the process. And I know that this has been said already today. I'm not the first person to come up with this idea, but I feel like that would have made such a difference for us. Um, I've been a mentor to other families kind of on an informal basis. Other parents have mentored me. Um, but it wasn't at all formalized in any sort of way. And it also involved us kind of identifying those resources through other people just kind of by chance. Um, so what we're finding is that parents are going home without the support they need. And really it would be so great if they got the support right at the beginning before they even knew um, what the road ahead entailed. Um, and then uh, I just also wanted to just acknowledge that this week is really meaningful for my family because just two days ago my son's feeding tube was removed, which after five years, which is something that I didn't know would, if it would ever happen. Um, and I feel like I really, I hope that I can do whatever I can to make it easier for other families who are going through this process. Sometimes we feel we're not heard, or we're repeating the same thing over and over and over again, and people get bored. Um, so I'm kind of glad that you guys are all new and you don't know our story. Um, so I'm going to start with, um, yeah, I have a seven-year-old diva who um, was born at two pounds, six ounces at 33 and a half weeks. We were in the NICU for 100 days, and that's after we left um, against medical advice. Um, we got a suspected diagnosis of what they call cocaine syndrome. Um, long story short, it, these kiddos are born old, so they're born um, with glaucoma, cataracts, um, and they're not the type that they suspect Mia to have. Um, they don't live past seven years old. Mia turned seven in May, so my anxiety has gone up. Um, on top of that, um, Sorry, but I always carry pictures. Oh. <laughs> um, so um, we survive. I say we survived the NICU. We survived. We have been surviving. Um, and though we have been a two-parent um, family, um, you'll learn that I'm the only medical person in our family. Um, that being said, I just graduated with my master's in nursing in May of last year. Um, that has always been my dream, but even so, I feel um, I can't do my part in being a responsible, functional, functional, functional citizen um, because I have to take care of my child. Um, as Michelle just mentioned, and um, literally if I can cut and paste Erica's um, <laughs> speech, I would, um, because um, it is an isolating journey, and it wasn't until we met parents at um, the project leadership that we no longer felt alone. Um, and it's because we can share and say, hey, you know, this is what's going on. Um, after 100 days in the NICU, um, I think what saved me from 
people always, uh, the big question is when you have a, when you're raising a child with special health care needs, how do you do it? You're going to do it regardless. Um, you have no choice because that child is, um, you live for that child and you want to make sure that she has the best quality of life. Um, I think what kind of, and I say this now and I can acknowledge this now, what saved me is that I've always wanted to be a nurse. So I was intrigued by the anatomy and physiology behind me as um, care. But um, how I mentioned the anxiety has now risen because she, even though she's not diagnosed, she's reaching an age where she might not make it. Um, so in that, in, in that is encompassed a lot of other things. Since we left the NICU, I have been her, I have had little time to be her mom because I have been her care coordinator. I have been her advocate. I have been her therapist. I have been um, every name in the social system um, services. Not that I don't want to. I don't want to. This thing. Okay. How do I say this? I don't want to. Um, the systems are there. They're great, but they're not working. Um, and by that, you'll learn why. When me, Daniel will share. Um, Mia left the NICU without having a diagnosis, so she wasn't eligible to have CCS. So we went without therapy after she turned three from regional center. So there's a. There goes back to that disconnection from zero to three. There's all this funding. There's all this. That let's go, let's go, let's get the development in. Um, Mia turned three and Mia showed physical disability with a dislocated hip and she was not, it, oh, it's the school responsibility now. Um, okay, so we did that. We went to a seminar, Abilities Expo, where we learned about Europeds in Michigan. Um, Europeds in Michigan is a, um, it's, it's a, an intense physical therapy program. So we, Went through it doesn't it's not covered through private insurance so we had to pay out of pocket and we left our lives and went there for two weeks where Mia received therapy for two weeks two hours a day and if we would have stayed longer Mia would have crawled um, our story is that we didn't know about CCS until I did my clinical rotation at Children's Hospital Oakland and that was about a year and a half ago that's where we fell through the cracks that's where we speak the language and that's where um, I, like, I, I, I share it not with the intention that something, someone went wrong, because we don't, I don't want to say it was a transition from counties to counties, but it shouldn't have happened to us, and I don't know how, and I don't know why. Um, so we went to Michigan to do um, intense physical therapy, brought back what we learned, what we know works for Mia, because what you'll hear is, yes, we're here to listen, we're here to, we want the parents' input, but we, um, it goes back to one of the questions, what has our experience become in being advocates? It's been great, but we get a lot of pushback because we know our child. Um, and just to quote Dr. Ed Shore, I read his um, personal advocacy paper, families are always on the lookout for new services and treatments and devices that are gonna help their child. And that's what we did because we thought CCS was non-existent. And with that being said, I'll give it to Daniel. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, where the dads at? There isn't, there isn't any dads, and that's kind of uh, that's kind of uh, it worries me big time, and, and it does kind of uh, concern me. Uh, but I definitely do want to thank uh, Family Voices. I want to thank uh, you know Lucio Packer Foundation of Children's Health for funding the project leadership. Uh, that for me was was uh, a blessing in disguise for me joining project leadership and then finding my own voice. As a, as a father and an advocate for a child with special health care needs. Uh, so I want to do that shout out to, to uh, Allison Gray and Pitt Marks for, for bringing us on board and putting me next to these, these amazing people here. Um, well, she's always been around, but the rest of you. <laughs> but nonetheless, so that, that personally for me, it, it is something that concerns me, but that's a whole different uh, conversation for me. For me, picking back you know, on, on what Emily mentioned as far as uh, what uh, Dr. Shore did kind of quote that, uh, they, uh, families, he refers, are always on the lookout for new services and treatments and devices that will help the child. So for us, I do try to find the silver lining in everything, and for us falling through the cracks of CCS to, to a degree it was a blessing for us. And the reason I mention that is because we actually searched for other services, not just within California, but even around the world, that we could potentially take our daughter to. We came across Europeans in Michigan, which was an intensive program, a therapy program. We ran a, we ran across 
Crit Peloton, which I don't know if folks might be a little familiar with, but we included an article that does talk about that in your packet. And there's 27 centers that are a one-stop shop in throughout, I believe, Mexico, Latin America. And uh, they provide not just uh, PT and OT, they provide a myriad of services. Uh, so at Crit, and there's, there's actually one that they just opened up in Texas, the first one in the United States. And uh, they achieve those, so they, what they do there is they provide intensive uh, outpatient physical rehabilitation for children, and it's just for children. They provide speech therapy to those children who need speech therapy. They provide psychological counseling and therapy for the children and their families. They provide prosthetic and other uh, devices for use in rehabilitation activities at home or for use in improving mobility or other functions on a day-to-day -day basis. They provide the occupational and financial counseling for the entire families and they provide education and counseling for the children and their families to ensure that they understand how to use all the uh, durable medical equipment. So the reason I bring this up is because since we did fall through the cracks of CCS, we searched for another location that does provide these services and uh, we found a couple of items. And in this complete new redesign of CCS, for us, for, for us as a family, we believe it should become a one-stop shop, not under a medical, uh, a managed medical, uh, care system, but it should be a one-stop shop where it's a specialized place that it treats just children to, with that, you know, OT, PT, and aqua, aquatic therapy they offer there. And the reason I bring this up is this, because one of the questions that they proposed to us in preparation for this, for this, uh, for speaking in front of you folks was what, okay, what should providers, and I want to include on there besides providers, but also policymakers, what should providers and policymakers anticipate in terms of impact on these families? What I want to lay as a question to the entire group and for you folks to ask as you go about your daily lives and professionally is, there will be a migration of families, there already is. In the article there, that the, the yellow one, you'll see that there's, fa there's a California family that attends an entire month in Texas, then moves back to California for five months, then goes back to Texas for a month, all to include the therapy for their child, the one-stop shop. There's 600 families on the waiting list for the center. So obviously this center is doing something amazing. It's the first one in the US, there's 27 in Mexico, Latin America. So the question I want to propose is, is can then these professionals, can the policymakers be ready for this migration of families as, as ourselves? We're potentially thinking of migrating and moving to Texas and to be closer to a place that can provide these services. We don't want to move to Texas. We're Californians, we've been Californians our entire life. And so, I just want to leave that question out there. If California doesn't provide the services that we need, then unfortunately we do have to migrate elsewhere. And I don't want to do that. We don't necessarily want to do that, but we will do. Uh, as our families before us have done, uh, as far as migrating here. Uh, but that's something that we will do. Um, well, because our families are, what, what you'll learn, um, our families are changing, and many of you may know that. Mia can no longer do physical therapy because Correct. she has a dislocated elbow, which they're not going to do surgery for, and a dislocated hip. So water therapy is the next best thing. It's not covered by private insurance and it's not covered um, by uh, CCS or Medi-Cal. And although I am a master's graduate program and I'm working part time, um, I don't have the means to continue saving up on top of, you know, um, not getting that criticism of like, well, you're not really raising your child. You have a caregiver raising your child. But then you want me to be a functional citizen to kind of do my two part. So that's, that's a difficulty that's encompassed with families like ours. It's not that, we don't want to. For me, going to work is my saving grace. I don't. I didn't go to a support group. I didn't believe in them until now, and that's seven years later. Um, but that's where it gets difficult um, because it's a. We need the assistance, but we, even though we are educated and we can speak their language, we financially don't have it sometimes. And this pro this type of program is working with Medi-Cal in Texas, and I, and but it goes back. Yes, everything changes county to county, but our families are changing. They're not going to stay zero to three at all times like regional center. They're going to grow if they have the ability to grow. And if so, then things have to change as they go. Ditto. So, <laughs> but California will miss, on the, miss out on an amazing nurse. We do have to end up in <laughs> Thank you.
Hi, I'm Cherise LeBlanc, and um, I'm really glad to be here with these amazing people. Um, and I just wanted to thank all of the speakers that came before us because they just nailed so many things that I was thinking and that I wanted to say, and I have four pages of stuff here. So um, I especially, um, what Eric has said resonated with me. Just that perspective is just invaluable. I just wanted to encourage people um, that are working in the profession um, to get to know families, maybe outside of your profession, um, that have children with uh, special medical needs because that will only enrich your life as a person and also add to your expertise um, as you do your, your jobs. Um, and I, I say that wholeheartedly and with um, a lot of compassion because we all have a lot on our plates and not that people aren't already doing that, but there's nothing like direct experience. Um, so the other thing that I would really <laughs> highly recommend is um, for anyone that's in the healthcare or social services field, um, this book has been incredible for me just in um, really touching me on a level that somebody really gets it. Like this person really took the time they invested uh, their time to get to know families that are going through all types of um, health issues, uh, mental health issues, uh, cognitive um, issues that, that are raising kids with all kinds of disabilities. And there are different stories. It goes through deafness and schizophrenia and orthopedic impairment and autism and, you know, just a, a whole range of, of disability. It's called Far From the Tree. And it's incredible. So um, I would really recommend this to actually be part of the curriculum for anyone that is entering the health field or the social services field because it really gives you a good background of what families are going through. So um, that was my other little suggestion. Um, so um, I, I have a daughter and I have a son. Uh, my son is uh, typically developing. My daughter is Kayla and she is um, she'll be 16 in July. She has a condition called bilateral perisovian syndrome, and um, I had a diagnosis very early on. I knew something was different with her brain uh, at 38 weeks, and we just didn't know what it was. We just knew it looked different on the ultrasound. So I kind of knew, you know, that we would be in for some challenges. Um, and so basically, without going through her whole medical history, um, she is on the severe end of the syndrome, um, and so she has cerebral palsy, she has intractable epilepsy, um, she has a G-tube, although she eats by mouth as well. She's had the G-tube since about age two, um, that she gets all of her meds through. Um, what else? Uh, oh, she has a vagal nerve stimulator, which is supposed to help with epilepsy, but we didn't get any results with that either. Um, and then she has sort of, she's non-vocal, a lot of throat, tongue, mouth, musculature issues. Um, but despite all of that, what I just described, I didn't bring a picture uh, to you guys today, but she's, she's a really um, communicative little girl, loves life, is very active. She is not ambulatory, but walks with assistance. So my daughter's been surfing, she's been on boogie boards, um, she swims with assistance, so she does a lot of things. Um, and I just, my, my main thing today is that I, I really think having some help um, along the way with Kayla, because she's, she's able to have that quality of life because my dad and her dad and myself have invested the time, we've had the resources um, to do it. Um, not necessarily always financial, but just because, you know, I'm, I'm educated and um, he works really hard. We were able to really give her a lot of opportunities, but so many families are not in that position. And so whenever I speak, I'm speaking on behalf of lots of other families that aren't able to, to do it. Uh, but for us, having a care coordinator or whatever you want to call it, just someone there to help guide us 
um, from those very early days would have been just so valuable. Um, the stress level is off the charts. It still is to this day. She's almost 16 years old. Um, and I think it just, in terms of the quality of life for families raising children with special needs, um, we just, we just, we really need a helping hand. And it's not, it's not that we're not willing or able to do things for ourselves, but um, cutting out some of the confusion and some of the um, sort of uh, different information we get from different agencies, a lot of misinformation, cutting some of that out would be really, really helpful. Um, there's so much more than I wanted to say, and I'm running out of time. Um, but let's see if I can just come up with uh, some of these things. So um, in, in terms of moving forward with the systems changes that are being proposed, I just really think that having parents as part of the decision-making body on all levels is so, so crucial. And, and I really don't mean just lip service or as an afterthought or look, we have a, our token parent here. I mean, really, you know, a vested interest in including um, parents, their perspective, their experience, their expertise, uh, because really, ultimately, the system is supposed to be serving those children and their families, and so that should be at the center of any decision that's made. Budgets, policies, all that stuff is secondary to your main focus, which is providing um, excellent health care and social services to um, children, you know, that have special health care needs and supporting their families. So it, it requires a mindset shift and a paradigm shift. And I'm not too confident about how we will get there. Um, but I think if we don't sort of change the way that we do business as usual, it's, it's not looking very um, bright, and I'd love to move my perspective from bleak to bright. So we really do need to partner with parents and the family resource agencies that, that help um, parents become advocates, because they're great resources for partnering. So, thanks. not only for you, but for other families that could participate mm -hmm. in this kind of opportunity. And so I, I want to just mention that too, because I think that without, maybe you would have said though, you know, you would have been able to come and be here with us and say all that, but I think that the training helped give you a, a, a platform from which to really 
speak so eloquently about the lives that you are living with the children in your lives. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I agree. I'm wondering, um, in knowing that you know we all are going to need to advocate going forward, for you as parent advocates, what would be kind of your ideal for um, professionals to sort of join and support you in advocacy? What's, what, what would you think? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I would just say starting with um, a vision, a really strong vision in place with children and families at the center. And again, it goes back to the paradigm and the mindset change that people don't always fit into budgets like the budget is the big thing, and then we try to fit everything into that. I think that that focus really needs to be turned upside down. Um, and that requires a lot of um, will and a lot of way, different ways of looking at things. So keep that in mind that you know policies and, and things like that um, are put in place supposedly to support people. But in, our, in my experience, and I think in the experience of a lot of people up here, that's not the case. You go to agencies for help, and you're the you're treated. You know, um, you're not welcomed. You're treated as uh, sort of a um, what do I want to say a liability. Like, what? How much is this person going to cost me? Instead of what do you need, or or is this person going to cost me my job because my boss is on my back about you know um, me giving away too many services? And I'm not just talking to be talking. This is like my experience and. So um, just keep that in mind, just being an ally with the families that you're working for and with. Yeah, um, to, to piggyback just on that a little, um, as simple as like uh, the family resource centers, like regional center, um, a nurse in the, in the clinical setting, when, when we're trained as nurses, there's a four to one ratio in a hospital setting. You're dealing with special health care needs children a nurse should not have 600 families to take care of. <laughs> and it goes back, and, 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 I, and, I, and I wanted to kind of chime in because I didn't want to discredit, I felt really bad, I felt, I, I felt like I discredited the, the master social workers. It's not that they're not capable, they don't have that clinical setting experience that, that, that the nurses do. So when, um, it, it's just, it's a, it's, it's a really absurd number, 600 families, no wonder we fall through the cracks. Like, you know, and so, and then the social workers don't feel supported. So yeah, they're, then they become us where they're constantly being that octopus. And then they hear us, like, why aren't you getting back to me on time, why aren't, and why am I teaching you about these resources when we're going to them? So that's why we do go to family resource networks. And they differ by counties, because I'm now in the county family, and I went to San Francisco for support for families. Mm -hmm. So then there's that disconnection. So something as, as the lower level. Yeah, can I, can I just finish up with one other thing? Um, just if you do sit on any um, decision-making bodies, maybe suggest to that decision-making body to have parent involvement. And again, it's not just to have it for the sake of having it, it's to really value that contribution. Um, and like family resource centers really do a lot for, um, for families, um, but they're a really great resource for getting parents that want to get involved and that are knowledgeable and have expertise and can help you with whatever decisions you're making or policy. And I don't, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but you can ask for clarification. I just want to echo um, what Emily and Sharice just said, and, and going off what Sharice is saying about having parents involved, like if there's any sort of committee, advisory, policy-making body, and then I just want to channel um, our fellow project leadership graduate, Anne, who is always, who's kind of giving me the confidence to say this out loud, which is that parents need to be paid for coming. Because everyone who's there as a professional, who's a salaried professional, is being paid to be there. They're not taking a vacation day, and in most cases. And um, in my previous life, I advocated for youth leaving foster care, and. That was our commitment, is that anytime we had a former foster youth come and speak, testify, anything, we paid them. Not just paying them for childcare, for transportation, but actually paying them to be there because we considered them as important, if not more important, than the professional advocates. And I was a professional advocate and I felt like their, their voice was, was more important than mine.
Okay. I just want to add something real quick to that, real brief, is that in, in doing so, and the professionals working with parents of children with special health care needs, we can't necessarily add that title to a business card. Mm -hmm. And being aware that uh, an MD can add that to their last name, uh, you can add an MBA to your business card, you can add, you know, RN to your business card, but you can't add. Uh, and a lot of times I think what I've seen with professionals is that they don't necessarily give parents the credit that that's not something that you go to school for. And, and you know, it's something that you learn through life. Uh, and sometimes it's a few years, sometimes it might be decades, but something to be aware of that. And even if you don't see it on a business card or on an email, uh, you know, attachment, the credit's still there. So just to keep that in mind, please. One last question. I just want to thank you guys for, yes, this, yes. for listening yes. to us. Um, yes. More so, um, yeah, thank you for inviting us and having us. And um, more so because we are talking at you. And I don't know your life story, how dang said. I don't know what your background is. It could be just as hard as mine. I know personally, like, I only have one child because I can only handle one. Is the other one sitting right next to me? <laughs> <laughs> but he's been very empowering in terms of, of dads, and that's where um, I, I wrote him a note, like, make sure you say something, because it, it is true. Every training we go to is it's women, and sorry, it's female empowerment, but at the same time, at this it's, it's, it's a two-parent home, and it takes a lot of work. And um, so it starts with, with you guys, too, with your willingness to listen to us, to, to stay here a little bit over um, the, the, the training and, and having your blood sugar back up with candy. Um, but even though we're talking at you and it sounds like we're just complaining or maybe telling our story and it sounds like all this horrible stuff has happened, we really seek your guidance. We seek your professionalism and your, your training, um, but also what we ask from that is listen to us when you ask for that. Because we, with our experience, it's been asked, but it's, we're still fighting for it. But um, I really want to thank you because it starts with people like you who are willing to listen. Well said. Please join me in thanking the panel.